In October 1988, special trains ran to celebrate 125 years of railways in New Zealand. And steam was to the fore. As in the centenary, the National Film Unit was there to record the event. It was 1863 in early December when the first railway engine set off from Christchurch to Ferrymead, four miles away, to open the track and make history. William Sefton Moorhouse was the originator, and his railway between Littleton and Christchurch is now one of the busiest in the country. But among today's visitors are a group of railway enthusiasts who'll be looking for memories of the pioneering past. This is their commemoration, a tribute to the grand old days of steam and the service that's behind the railways of today. When the centenary was held in 1963, most of the South Island was still steam and preservation was just beginning with engines like F-13 and 163. Twenty-five years later, steam returned to Christchurch. Preservation had come of age. Site of New Zealand's first railway, the Ferrymead Historic Park is regarded as the birthplace of the New Zealand preservation movement. As in Britain, preservation in New Zealand has flourished, and Ferrymead's now one of a dozen working railways and museum parks around the country. During Rail 125, a steam shuttle service operated between Christchurch Station and Ferrymead, connecting with such delights as this Kitson steam tram, the only one of her kind operating anywhere. From Ferrymead, the shuttle services went on to Littleton. C864 was always a local engine, and besides the little Fs, she's been the only steam engine to haul a train through the tunnel since 1963. Yes, a real live engine breathing real live steam. Long-lived identities they are too. This little old girl, over 80 years old, is still at work in the docks of Littleton. Built in 1872, F13 lasted in service for 91 years. Soon there won't be so many of these jobs or semi-retired engines. Now 116 years, F-13's the oldest locomotive assembled for the cavalcade of motive power in Christchurch. For the 125 festivities, locomotives came from as far as Auckland, joining on the Sunday morning at the old steam depot at Linwood. Just for a few hours, the combined effect of hot oil, sulphur and steam from 13 engines wafted around Linwood as it used to all those years ago. Spectacle to follow was the equivalent of Rail 150 near Darlington in 1975, and the cavalcade would take 90 minutes to pass through Christchurch Station. C864 is one of two survivors of a class of American-inspired shunting engines built in 1930. Following unfortunate experience with Bayer Garrett's, NZR designers overcame the limitations of the three-foot, six-and-a-half-inch gauge with the K-class. Most powerful of the five preserved 484s is KB968. With Booster, she's as powerful as a Duchess Pacific. At 147 tons, the largest. At 11 tons, the smallest to run on the NZR was the old A. 
Obsolete by 1900, four have survived. Over 30 small engines have lasted from Victorian times, although C-132 is the only one left of her class. Metropolitan-inspired D-16 has cousins on the Isle of Man steam railway and makes a fine Victorian couple with the composite birdcage carriage. New Zealand's cavalcade of steam made an early debut in that other great cavalcade of celluloid. Beyond the platform we can just glimpse a single fairly shunting, unseen by onlookers more intent on a movie camera. On Friday, November the 15th, 1901, the 455 train for Wellington departs Palmerston North. Built locally by A&G Price, this CB spent its working life on bush tramways in both islands. An unusual load for a CB, one of two unrestored NZR suburban passenger tank engines, WAB 794. In all, 151 AB Pacifics were built between 1915 and 1927, and they were New Zealand's equivalent of the Black Five. Seen all over the country, they were the first locomotive in the world to develop one horsepower for every 100 pounds of engine weight. Six ABs have been saved. Behind 699, WD357, a Baldwin. AB608, the first AB built, and X442, a mountain class from 1909. Another Price engine. This V was built in 1943 and worked for 20 years on a West Coast bush tramway. Altogether, 88 Fs found their way to every corner of the Dominion. F-13 is the eldest of nine examples that have braved the years through to the present day. This little fowler was one of 16 used for public works projects around the country. J1211 is very much a product of her time. Evolving from the Art Deco period along with Hudson's on the 20th Century Limited and Gresley A4's on the Flying Scotsman, this was true industrial art. Here the American influence prevailed via the New Haven Railroad and the design of Otto Kula, which inspired these bullet-nosed beauties of 1939. Logical development were the JAs. 1250 is one of 10 Js and JAs to last from a fleet of 91. Along with other advanced technology, the JAs ran on roller bearings, were reliable in service, and were firm favorites with engine crews. In December 1956, it was a JA, 1274, that was to become the last steam engine built in New Zealand. In 1889, W192 was the first. 192 enjoyed a varied life and for a time attempted to help out on the Rimutaka incline. However, she'd have been more at home in this film taken in Southland in about 1922. Covered wagons were quite acceptable to picnickers in these days before the family car.
The locomotive is one of the handsome U-Class, number 65, built in 1898. One nine two was restored where she was built ninety nine years later by staff of the Addington Workshops. Along with F one six three, she's owned by railways and hauls old time trains on occasional outings on the main line. AB 608 is a famous engine. On the 12th of March 1927, she was driven by the Duke of York between Arthur's Pass and Cass. The Royal Tour went off with a bang, but nothing could eclipse the fireworks that AB's 833 and 744 produced around the North Island on the Royal Train. In this age, royalty used motor cars for local jaunts. Twenty-seven years later, their daughter toured New Zealand as a young Queen Elizabeth II. Though the coast and its warm hearts are left behind her, the loveliness of Westland will be with the Queen until she reaches the Alps. Lake Brunner in Māori Moana Kotuku the Sea of Herons. On the west coast, the Royal Train was again hauled by ABs, this time 787 and 795. The river Taramakau, swift flowing when swollen by alpine snows, is within sight until the train nears Otira at the western end of the Commonwealth's longest railway tunnel. Here, steam gives way to electricity for the trip under the Alps. The EOs were built by English Electric in 1922 for the 1 in 33 haul up through the Otira tunnel. The Royal Cipher will be theirs until steam takes over again beyond the five and a quarter mile tunnel. On this Monday in January 1954, Otira was a loyal town of railway staff and their families, and one little girl saw her chance and took her own special picture of a royal train. And so, farewell to Westland. After the tunnel, the long descent to the plains of Canterbury will commence. It's a journey which will take the Queen through a maze of tussock-clad hills and past the gorge of the Waimakariri River as it snakes through mountain defiles. Hauling the train for the rest of the tour, JA's 1262 and 1263 were brand new. So many other whistle hopes that a stopwatch would be better. It's not until we see the final polish being given to the Royal Train that our joy becomes tinged with sadness. For these are the engines that will draw her away out of our midst. A handshake for the Mayor, Mr. Ari White, and the Queen is on her way to the south. Thames Street crossing in Omaru, and the Royal Train's dead on time. The Queen doesn't know it, but her arrival's given particular pleasure to Mr. R.S. Simonster, the station master, who's about to retire after 40 years unbroken service. You can guess his feelings as he watches his staff jump to their duties. It's the moment of his life as the Queen is about to walk on his platform. <laughs> To every vantage point they scramble to see her. From the hospitals even the cot cases are brought out, happy because of that one glimpse. The event was a little sad as this was the last time that steam would haul a royal train in New Zealand. In pageantry and war, times of triumph and tragedy, during World War II, the steam locomotive was up there, on the front. In spite of shortages of men and rolling stock, they now carry nine million tons of freight every year, compared with seven and a half million tons in peacetime.
It's hard to imagine how a system using imported fuels could have coped. Powered by local coal, the steam railway became a force required to endure beyond expectation. Shunting is completed quickly and smoothly, and the next job is making up the goods train. From the shunting yards and wharf, the rakes are taken to the departure roads. Usually a peaceful force, steam seemed indestructible. Poor deluded country lads, Hitler called them. Though no army in all history has known better what it was up against and what it was fighting for. They helped to make this country the way it is. Happy, prosperous, free. After all, the nation's production and fighting fronts are only as strong as its transport front. If there's a bottleneck in transport, all else is lost. The war brought many transport problems. In spite of all difficulties, the greatest traffic movement of our history still goes on. During the six war years alone, the shops completed 32 heavy KA class engines. At the engine sheds, boys are seeing how everything works. Scenes like these children visiting Palmerston North Loco Depot typify railways high profile in war. Every day, three or four groups visit these railway yards. The charismatic K.A. certainly had a following. Emerging battered from battle, these streamlined giants symbolized a life force out of war, in peace. A double-headed goods and the northbound New Plymouth Express are two of the last trains to run over the old road between Turakina and Okoya on the Wellington-Wanganui line. The construction of a deviation via Wangahoo, Bordell and the Matarawa Valley, undertaken more than 10 years ago, is almost completed. With its three tunnels, the deviation cuts out the two steep grades on the old road. This will reduce running time, enable heavier loads to be hauled, while eliminating extra engines and saving valuable fuel. Controlling both road and rail traffic has been a full-time job for a bridge keeper since the bridge was built nearly 50 years ago. Jim Heavey has been closing the road gates whenever a train was due for four years. His uncle did it for 22. This old bridge dates back to the days of coaches, carts and gigs. For horse-drawn traffic, ten minutes wait for a train to go by was little inconvenience. But now it's different. After the war, the Iron Horse and its following went on, seeming to ignore the winds of change. The old wooden bridge has served its purpose, and from now on it will carry road traffic only. Even then, its days are numbered, for plans for a new road bridge are already on the drafting board. It's a free country, and these two fellows have parked their trains to discuss the final crash in the Railway Rugby Series for the year, Wanganui versus Awakuni. We'd better leave them to it and get on our way to good old Ty Hatley, or we'll miss the game. Trains from Wanganui and Awakuni bring followers young and old to lend a hand on the sidelines. It's Sunday and Ty Happy and car-free roads give carefree people lots of latitude on their way to the football ground. Wanganui wins the toss and they spread out for the kickoff. And it's a little beauty right back into Awakuni's sidings. Good old Wanganui. In these days, railway workers were fiercely loyal to the job, and work and play were much the same thing. The crowd, they shunt all over the field, letting off steam in fine style. Awakuni finally pulls it off at 11 points to 8. Everyone's happy as the Cascade Cup is passed to the captain of the winning side, and he rides off in state. Better luck next time, Wanganui. Bring it up, you fellas, the game's over. Six persons were killed and 37 injured when the South Island Main Trunk Express from Picton to Christchurch was wrecked shortly after leaving Seddon, 20 miles south of Blenheim. The train was about to emerge from a cutting when the engine left the rails on a curve 
dragging the first coach with it. The suburban train was passing through Nahuranga Station on its way to the Hutt Valley. Without warning, a heavy mobile railway crane swung round, bringing its platform directly in the path of the oncoming train. The left cylinder of the engine took the first impact of the collision and was shattered immediately. Accidents always engaged the morbid interest of the cinema-going public. Most of the casualties occurred in the second and third coaches, both of which were spread-eagled across the line and badly damaged. Inspection of the wreckage and investigation as to the cause was immediately started, and the Honourable R. Semple, Minister of Railways, was early at the scene. The crane driver had a remarkable escape, receiving only a slight knee injury. The locomotive suffered considerable damage, and the driver and fireman were amongst the injured. Nearby settlers, train crew and passengers did all they could to help the casualties until medical aid and repair gangs arrived from Blenheim and other centres. Steam maintained a persistent presence in cinema shorts. Taking a look back into a day in the 50s, railways had about 400 steam engines that could be seen at work. On any night, their slumbering would warm the upper atmosphere over the ten main depots around the nation. For shunting and built for the job were 24 of the C-Class. These were helped out by 50 WWs spare from suburban passenger work. And 30 BB class 480s. Day in, day out, night in, night out, in a spectacle of slipping steel, sand and smoke they gradually wore themselves into the ground. Along dozens of branches and secondary main lines, the 151 members of the AB class were at large. and they were augmented by 57 converted A compounds. All these Pacifics could be seen at any kind of work. At any time in the day in both islands, some 150 Ks and Js were available for heavy haulage. JAs could haul 400 ton expresses and it was in the South Island that they made their mark. With 54 inch driving wheels they sometimes exceeded 70 miles an hour on the Canterbury Plains, uh, unofficially of course. On the North Island main trunk the Ks hauled 500 ton limiteds and a thousand tons of freight. Good, hard-steaming coal came from the west coast of the South Island. This was where many old locomotives ended their days, and where all the hard work had to be done. The steam railway was augmented by a number of rail cars on provincial services and electrics, mainly around Wellington. But most travellers on the main trunk only believed that the journey had really got underway when the KA took over at Paikokariki. And the diesels came. But tests showed that it wouldn't be so easy to match the power and speed of the KAs and JAs some even newer than diesels. By the 60s, steam was in retreat, but it still shone on the high iron. Oil burning JA 1280 is about to leave Auckland on the Night Limited in 1960. At eight years, she's halfway through her life. 
In the North Island, steam continued to haul all passengers on the main trunk into the second decade of the diesel era. Later in the South, 1280's coal-burning sisters would carry on to the very last day in 1971, heading express train. About 1150 steam engines saw life in New Zealand. They were born by fire, ran with fire, and died by fire. Of the hundred or so that survive, some are crown jewels. Number four of the Glenbrook Vintage Railway near Auckland is a Malay compound. Steam from the rear high pressure engine is reused at lower pressure by the front engine, which is articulated. Chi was built by Alco in 1912, and at 43 tons is a pocket edition of the mammoths that ran on the Denver and Rio Grande. On the Taupo Totra Timber Company, she hauled log trains along the sinuous tramway from Mukai. Today, she is ideally suited to the short, steep grades along the six kilometer Glenbrook Vintage Railway. Firing her is a precise art. H199 is the only fell locomotive left in the world. Once named after the Mont Cenis Pass in Europe, 199 now features in the Fell Museum at Featherston. At the opening of the Rimutaka Tunnel in 1955, 199 was saved for posterity. But it was the finish for the Rimutaka Incline which rose 800 feet in three miles between Cross Creek and Summit. A climb of 860 feet. For nearly 70 years, a special system has been in operation on this section of the wider upper line. Small but powerful fell engines, shown here in the yards at Cross Creek, have been used to draw all trains between this station and the summit. Linked with these engines in operation are fell brake bands, fitted with cast iron brake shoes. These shoes must be replaced after every trip down the incline. The terrific wear and tear on the brake shoes is illustrated by a pair shown before and after one journey. The six fell engines were based at Cross Creek. From Cross Creek, on the Featherston side of the range, a train drawn by fell engines gets underway. The engines are equipped with horizontal gripping wheels that run on an extra center rail. The center rail is double-sided and mounted above the ordinary running rails. The fells were two engines in one. Stevenson's valve motion actuated the outside engine, which used normal adhesion.
Running independently, two inside cylinders drove horizontal wheels that could be made to grip the center rail on the incline. The engines had separate regulators. This railway track is one of the stiffest in the world and it winds over the Rimutakas for 15 miles. The new tunnel beneath the hills will eliminate nine miles of this slow, costly hauling. Work on the tunnel will take five years to complete and meanwhile the fair engines will carry on hauling trains over the old incline. The fell system has done good work but the new Rimutaka tunnel will make possible a great increase in prosperity for the whole of the Wairarapa. The incline was a temporary thing and lasted for 77 years. These scenes were taken near the end of World War I. Even now, the incline and its mountain railway were unique. The only other fell operation in the world last steamed back in 1883. When the fell system was first tested near Buxton in Derbyshire, who could know that its main exponent would be on the other side of the world? Three miles, climbing 800 feet. For all the years of spectacle, Life on the incline was usually uneventful. It's the proudest day in the history of the Rimutaka incline, as the coupling up of the fell brake van becomes a royal occasion. The Duke and the Inspector, both ex-navalmen, agree that brake vans are a stand-in for anchors, and they're needed on this gradient, the steepest in New Zealand. Reporters note it's the first and last time a reigning sovereign will use this route. The 76-year-old Bell Railway will be no more when the Rimutaka Tunnel is completed. After the royal tour, fame returned in the last weeks of operations. Ironically, the incline had always been recognized outside New Zealand, but not in nearby Wellington. What had been taken for granted would now be sorely missed. Well, the driver was perfectly home with them. We, the, the, the railway department supplied them with the best coal in New Zealand. It comes from strong on, my, uh, on the west coast. Coal on the footplate, coal on your feet. The fells used to eat coal, and what they didn't, you did. Brake shoes too, a new pair every trip. No wonder the old fells squeaked. Well, of course, they had to work flat out all the way up the, 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 the hill. And uh, uh, you can imagine, the, 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 they only took about 45 tonne uh, on, on a grade of 1 in 11, 1 in 13. Crabbing up the centre rail as though it wasn't a 1 in 15 grade. This engine's the pride of the fells. 77 years up and down the three mile climb. And still the same accents you brought from Bristol. The puffingest engines ever. Round Siberia, where a train was blown off the rails back in 1880. Never again, old fells. Over the years, cinema shorts captured the commonplace and from drudgery was distilled romance. In the very early morning, the railway yards at Wellington look almost romantic. Most of us in our heart of hearts cherish a nostalgic feeling about trains. But let's come in a little closer among the grit and noise and smoke and meet some of the people who work on the railways. Let's see something of how a day's work goes there.
By sunrise, many of these people have been working all night and soon will go home for breakfast. Many of them will never travel beyond the railway yards. Oh, there's nothing romantic here, they'll tell you. It's just a job like any other. But it's a job that's dirtier than most, sometimes dangerous, always exacting. All the same, railway people speak of their jobs with a certain reserve of pride. No matter how small or obscure their individual work may be, they have the satisfaction of knowing that the community can't get on without them, and that they, in turn, have a responsibility to the community. At this early hour in the morning, the day's work in the depots is already half finished. Already, most of the trains are busy on the roads, bringing people to the city, taking them from town to town. In some senses, each railway worker has a part in every train that runs. The express which left Auckland 12 hours ago is their train, their responsibility, even though they work in Wellington. Running trains is essentially a cooperative business, and railway people have a clear sense of what that means. In the goods depots, the day's work takes a different tempo. It's broad daylight here before the loading begins. Thousands of wagons a year, millions of tons of goods. Statistics and figures don't mean much in terms of sheer physical labor and practical knowledge. The goods they handle are a reflection of the country's wealth. And in that sense, these men have a link with the life on the land. Even sale day is a special day for them as well as for the farmers. Like the proverbial housewife, their work is never done. There's always a fresh train load to deal with, a continual and unending flow of goods. It's lunchtime too in the hut workshops. Here's a different kind of railway life. These boys are apprentices to highly specialized trades. In the afternoon, they're attending their school. No matter what trade they're training for, to be fitters, electricians, boiler makers, carpenters, they must have a solid grounding in trade theory. Their apprenticeship course takes five years and they'll then be qualified as skilled tradesmen. But of course it's in the shops that these boys really learn their skill. Here's an engine being stripped down for a complete overhaul. part goes off to the gang which specializes in its repair. Finally, the stripped engine is swung down the shop to the assembly gang. And here's a newly overhauled engine coming out of the shops, bright and shining, for another 80 or 90,000 miles of service. tradesmen who repair the train to the gangs who repair the train lines, the surface men. Their job is to keep the permanent way in good condition for the heavy loads it has to carry. Here, for example, they're adjusting the cant on the lines above the Waimakariri Gorge. Of all the people who work on the railways, the surface men have the loneliest lives. In some remote parts of the country, they see nobody but the members of their own gang for weeks at a time. Their only chance of social life is the visit to another railway community, perhaps 20 or 30 miles away. Such a community is Otera, a true railway town. They say even the dogs work on the railway here. Tonight there's to be a dance in the social hall, and the refreshment room girls are discussing the prospects. By evening at the little stations and halts down the line, groups of twos and threes are waiting to be picked up by the slow train. One of the refreshment room girls is already off duty and ready to show off her new dress.
Social functions of this kind go on wherever railway people live. Because of the difficult hours they work, because they're often moved from one locality to another, because these localities are so often isolated, they have to depend very much on the company of their fellow railway workers for their social life. And a very good life they make it. While one lot of railway people are enjoying themselves at Oterra, others are preparing for a long night's work. Bill Fletcher is an engine driver at Tamaranui. At midnight he has to pick up the southbound express and bring it on the line. This is a familiar scene in a railway man's house, as one member is putting on his boots and others ready to go to bed. And the wife cuts sandwiches and bottles tea at all hours of the day and night. The disruption of their home life is one of the most difficult things that railway people have to put up with. Engines are changed on the express at Tamaranui, so there's a good deal of preparation necessary before the train pulls up. The coaches are at the platform. To the passengers, a train journey is an upheaval, an interlude in their normal lives. They scramble for their cups of tea and sandwiches and copies of the evening paper, while the porters and pillow sellers and bookseller girls look after their comfort. Thank you. Just wait there, we've got to keep going. Oh, happy? I'm happy. And again. All seats. Oh, happy? Open Wellington Express. Hurry on, please. The express pulls out for the steep climb up the spiral and as it steams through the blackness the railway workers are doing the jobs that have become their lives. The passengers may work at desks, in factories and behind counters, but the train crew works on wheels. Most expresses on the trunk ran through the King Country at night and these scenes from steam in the cinema are rare. Highlight of 125 were the sights and sounds as steam returned to the Midland line. Arthur's Pass with its tight curves, 1 in 50 gradients and 16 tunnels was the stamping ground of the KB484.
The Jays were never a match for a KB, but as 12.50 and 12.11 entered the Broken River Gorge with 21 on the drawbar, they did their best to equal the performance. The way to Arthur's Pass, on to Otira and the coast, is always impressive. But today, an 18-year spell was being broken, and an old magic was awake in the Southern Alps.
During 125, the restored 482s were triumphant on the main line and their performance was faultless. Their design was American, but the Jays were built by North British in Glasgow. Later, the JAs were built in New Zealand without streamlining at Hillside Workshops, Dunedin, and they were produced with great pride. An 800-weight coupling rod, white hot from the furnace, is beaten into shape by a two-ton steam hammer. When cool, the forged parts are scribed and marked for final shaping and drilling in the machine shop. A surface grinder finishes them off to within thousandths of an inch, a standard of accuracy demanded throughout. In the final assembly, every part must fit perfectly in an engine that has to haul heavy loads over thousands of miles without the slightest trouble. A coat of paint and a head of steam and another engine is ready for trials. The JAs are coal burners and were specially designed for use on the South Island main lines. The building of 35 of these engines at the rate of one every seven weeks is a major engineering job and one that the men at Hillside can be justly proud of. After 125, JA 1250 steamed the thousand kilometers home to the Glenbrook Vintage Railway. it was a stimulating change from driving diesels and it took about 10 minutes to recall their skills. From then on it seemed as if she would steam forever. It's a reality, the Waranui Parnassus Line. There were many difficulties of construction in driving a line through the seaward Kaikouras. Tunnels were even built in the open to guard against slips. Now completed, this line will give access to many acres of farmland. From public works camps, special trains bring the families of the men who built the railway, and the men themselves. good reception, those who had the faith and determination, who knew that New Zealanders could do the job. Kaikoura station sees the trains come in from the north from Picton, from the south from Christchurch, as crowds gather for the opening ceremony.
From that day in December 1945, the 482's weight prevented them from running north of Kaikoura, and a JA beyond here along the Pacific coast has only come with preservation. Residents who remember when the line was first suggested see a demonstration by the engine they longed to drive when they were small boys. All that remains now is to declare the line open. The ribbon is cut almost through and the official rail car opens the South Island main trunk. One line from Picton to the Bluff. In October 1988, New Zealand steam ran up some 4,000 kilometers and attracted thousands of travelers and well-wishers. Popular in preservation, steam continues to fascinate and compel, just as its power used to command the awe of small boys a couple of generations before. Some say the great age of railways peaked just before the Second World War, when stations lured the traveller through Doric columns to a mode of transport epitomising style and fashion. Streamlining of trains confirmed purpose and speed. There were still cinders and soot, but that was all part of the adventure. Trains looked as if they were going somewhere important. Already there were signs of change, but for the present, Steam was in there, all the way. <laughs>